Hello. Hello, Mr. Jonathan Pajot, how are you? I'm doing well. It's nice to meet you. It's great to meet you. I'm so, so excited to talk to you and, and glad we were able to schedule it so quickly. Usually it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little more available these days because of the, because we're doing this Kickstarter. And so we're kind of trying to, I try to keep my schedule clear for people who wanted to talk to me. Well, beautiful. I, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk to me. Great. Um. And yeah, you're, you know, you're relatively new to me on, on my radar, um, but I've, you know, I've listened to that conversation you had with Jordan Peterson recently, and um, I've listened to it three times, admittedly, okay. <laughs> because I love this topic um, that you're, that you're, your current work, but I wanted to um, first get your, just, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about yourself, because I was reading your bio and I was a little bit surprised not to see, I was expecting um, like professor of philosophy or religion, the way you are so articulate in storytelling, but you've got an, an interesting background. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about it. <clears throat> so I, um, I studied fine art in university. I was going to be a contemporary artist, but I was always very interested in knowledge in general. So I read quite a lot on my own, on my own and when I finished my uh, bachelor's degree in fine art, I became disillusioned both with the world of art and also the world of academia in general. I just seemed like it wasn't the place for me. And so I didn't pursue my life in that world. And uh, then I ended up taking all kinds of detours. You know, I lived in, in Africa for seven years. <clears throat> I also worked in the private sector, you know, working for different companies. And then finally, I started making uh, art for churches liturgical art, uh, church carvings. But all the time that that was happening, myself and my brother were both researching religious symbolism, studying it very intently, uh, and uh, kind of developing a way to talk about Christian symbolism, but also just symbolism in general, in a way that we could help modern, modern people understand. Um, and then in some ways, I met Jordan Peterson before he became famous. I kind of heard him on the radio and was really fascinated by the way that he spoke about things, and um, <clears throat> he was also he was he was also surprised that I was on similar lines as him, and that's kind of what launched my public speaking career. Because when we met, we started doing events together, and then he became uber famous, obviously. <laughs> and uh, and then when he became uber famous, he kind of dragged me along with him and just was would just be like, you know, throwing me out into spaces that I wasn't used to, you know, learning to express myself and speak. And so since then, I've been more and more spending a lot of my time uh, speaking and writing and talking about uh, religious symbolism. But I've also written a graphic novel with my brother and we're writing these fairy tales. You know, a long time ago, I, I also um, wrote plays and 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 produced plays. You know, I have a very varied lifestyle, very, very... I have many lives, it seems. That's how it feels sometimes. <laughs> that seems like a very fulfilling one, a way to uh, really kind of experience it all, get a taste of it all. Um, and Jordan Peterson seems like a very great friend to have, an auspicious friend on the path, as we say in yoga. <laughs> um, well, definitely. I mean, meeting him was really one of the key moments, I guess, of my life in this in this particular line, which is in the kind of public speaking and and encounter becoming like a public intellectual, whatever that means. Definitely, he he's been the the key on that path. Very sweet, and um, I think there's a real longing for storytelling, um, especially in um, the male male population. But before we get into that, I was wondering, um, you know, if you could tell me exactly what you're what you're currently working on, what your most recent project is. Yeah. So right now we. You know, one of the things that's been happening, I guess, for the past decade is we've watched a lot of the stories get twisted and framed ideologically. Even some of the big franchises, you know, people have watched Star Wars kind of go down the drain. We're watching Disney in general. All these franchises seem to be going down the drain, but also the way that the, the fairy tales are told, even the way that Disney is retelling the fairy tales, uh, seems they seem to want to really frame it ideologically and almost it's becoming 
political propaganda and ideological propaganda. And I've been watching people complain about that for a while. And I thought, you know, maybe we should stop complaining and maybe we should just do something about it. And the, what, what I wanted to do was to retell the fairy tales, the traditional fairy tales, the ones that are the most famous, but do it in a way that is celebratory, you know, without any excuses, uh, that also dives into the symbolism of the stories, tries to bring out the symbolism, you know, help people see what the stories are about, not through explaining them, but really through, you know, making certain aspects of the story shine, you know, let's say engaging in certain analogies, also referring the stories to each other. So we have these arcs of, of different fairy tales. And so right now we're publishing a version of Snow White called Snow White and the Widow Queen, which is an illustrated book for children, but that also has an adult reading in it that has a level of reading that is for grownups, not in the sense of dirty jokes like you would find in a Shrek movie or like, you know, the recent ways that people have done that, but rather uh, offering deep insight, connection to myth, connection to, to religious stories and how these fairy tales actually are in some ways a kind of map of reality for us. Hmm. I love that. And, and like I mentioned, I, I feel like there's a real longing for this in our culture. I really never expected myself to be drawn to mythology um, and storytelling for and in school growing up. <clears throat> I don't know if it was just not um, approached in a certain way that landed, but, um, you know, what is the importance of storytelling in our culture? And, you know, how does it, it shape our lived experience? I've had, you know, philosophy teachers in yoga explain, and, and they're also religious um, professors that, um, you know, you're meant to see yourself as every character in the story. And, a lot of the mythology is, you know, like sometimes lies that we tell each other to serve a higher truth. You know, what is, what's your sense? What is the importance of, of these stories and telling a, a better story? Well, I take it really from almost like a, it's like a technical point of view, which is that one of the things we're realizing, you know, even through cognitive science and more recent development in different fields, you know, we're facing what we call the problem of complexity, you know, the manner in which multiplicity and unity coexist, the manner in which multiplicities join into one, you know, the manner in which qualia, qualities of things are able to kind of appear above the, the things that constitute them. And what we realize is that in some ways that happens obviously in our object perception, it happens in, in all, at all kinds of levels, but it definitely happens in time and it happens with memory. That is that the way that we engage with the world is that we, we identify relevant aspects of reality and we string those relevant aspects of reality together into patterns. And those patterns are highly relevant to us. So we were able to remember them. And ultimately, that's in some ways what stories are. Stories are the manner in which consciousness engages with the world and is able to, to put, because everything, the millions of things are always happening to you all the time, right? It's, it, there's an indefinite of th amount of things happening to you simultaneously, constantly, but we don't, we don't attend to all of them and we don't necessarily, we certainly don't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the manner in which we attend and the manner in which we remember that is what constitutes stories. And you can imagine that, let's say you do that for yourself, right? So at the end of the day, your spouse, your, your partner asks you, how was your day? And then you, you tell a basic story of how your day went. And you have to find that sweet spot, finding relevant, interesting things. You have to not make it too long, not make it too short. It's like that's an exercise in contraction of information and, and discerning relevance in, in terms of events. But now you can scale that up and think that people have been doing that for tens of thousands of years, telling each other stories. And then some of those stories are remembered and some are not. And then those that are remembered get transmitted and then some vanish and they get refined because some things can't be remembered over long periods of time. We, we, we don't think of that, but think of a movie like Pulp Fiction, like in a hundred years, no one will be able to watch that movie it will be completely irrelevant to everybody because it's so idiosyncratic and it's so culture specific that it won't be able to remember. But fairy tales and myth, what they've been doing is basically con uh, contracting information, like uh, just basically smashing it together and using categories that have long duration, like fruits and, and a sword and 
you know, and like a deep forest and all these these basic, basic images that aren't, you know, something idiosyncratic to a particular moment. And that's why they're able to persevere through time. And so when we realize that these little stories, especially the fairy tales, the myths, the ones that have been remembered for a long time, they are a map of attention, a map of relevance. They can help us understand what it means to be human because they've been remembered, passed down and refined over such a long time. Yeah, and I, you know, when I feel like each person, <clears throat> I happen to revisit some of these fairy tales thanks to you and your work. And I, um, you know, I found myself seeing it through a totally different lens. I feel like we bring our own experiences. A third thing that we bring to these stories, I feel like our our own personal experience. And I feel like <clears throat> my my thought on this these stories is different now as an adult, as it before, you know, as compared to when I was a child, I'm sure if I were to, you know, reread them again through a different lens as a, uh, five years down the road, having experienced life in a different way, you know, you get something different every time when you read them, I feel. Yeah. Well, for sure. Because in some ways, especially the fairy tales, the ones that are famous, uh, the ones that, that really shine for us, it's because they contract so much information. Every sentence, every image is a highly, highly relevant thing. And so because of that, even when we engage with the story, we actually can't see the whole thing. We, we can't see the whole story. We actually, we even in that already contracted information, we tend to trace lines of meaning through the stories. Uh, you know, like we can see folds, some folds more than others or some aspects more than others. And so because of that, you can reread these stories over and over, over long periods of time, and they still unpack things for you because they they really do it, they're really similar to like the gospel stories or to you know mythological stories they they're they're almost at the same level in terms of how much contracted information they're able to contain hmm. and you know i'm i'm particularly concerned currently with the state of um boys and men um there's all kinds of new um new polls and and new information coming out about how men are more, you know, feeling more alone, depressed than ever before, and more sense, more, um, more sexless than ever, more online than ever. There's feels like there seems to be a, either a diminished sense of uh, narrative for men, no clear direction, or, you know, no, maybe no, no narrative for mm -hmm. men currently, you know, how, how do we shape the correct or a better story for men? Yeah, I think we, we definitely have to break some of the prejudices that have, you know, now landed and have found a root in our psyche, you know, the idea that adventure, you know, is, is not, is not important. The idea, for example, that success or that conquest or all these images that excite men you know the idea of doing something doing something no one's ever done before or pushing yourself to your limit all of these types of images that that tend to uh, even even the idea to some extent the idea of having an enemy right the idea of competing all of these types of things which which are what drive uh, masculine identity have you know have been represented to us as being uh, pathological, as being immoral in themselves. And so the first thing we have to do is kind of break that just in us and just not not accept that that frame. Um, and then then the second thing to do is to, you know, Jordan Peterson has a good sense of that, that there's opportunities all around you to excel, to outdo yourself, to to be a better person. And, and if you see that those, then, you know, you just go, just pick one, go down the line. Mm -hmm. And that is in some ways is a meta training, you know, for becoming better in general and understanding what it means to, to deal with your own foibles, your own faults, your own lack of discipline, all of this stuff. So if you train for a sport, for example, you're training yourself for life. You know, it's not just the sport. If you, if you g become really good at something, anything, then in some ways you're, you're also learning what it means to, to, to vanquish, uh, you know, to, let's say, to fight dragons and to, to beat foes and to do all that stuff that, that most men find great satisfaction in. Hmm. 
Okay. And I was wondering, you know, in your new project involving fairy tales, you know, which, which fairy tales did you decide to, to look at for, you know, male led stories? So in the, in the story, we're in the fairy tale story, we're going with the trickster stories. Um, it's mostly because fairy tales, they're easier to you easier to find those types of stories, male led trickster stories. It has something to do with the fact that in some ways fake fairy tales are folk stories. You know, they're kind of underdog stories to a certain extent, usually for the like regular people. And so there are a lot of trickster stories. So we're doing Jack and the Beanstalk as the first story. And then we're moving toward the Valiant Little Tailor. So a lot of giant killing stories that have to do with that. There's one that's a little less known, which is, uh, it's called Little Thumb. I might change this one. I'm not sure yet because it's it's later in the project. So I might change that one, but it's really, it's again, it's like the idea of the little guy that's able to kind of defeat the big guy. It's like kind of King David and David and Goliath type stories. Um, and so those are the male led, the, the, the last one I won't say because it's kind of a surprise, but those are the, nice. the, the male led ones that we're doing. Um, and trying to kind of understand, you know, the story of Jack and the Beanstalk is very profound for people now, which is that, you know, Jack finds himself without a father. You know, he ha only has his mother and a cow, which is almost like tongue in cheek. You know, just he just has the feminine, basically. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's a little maybe a bit, a bit too much. And so he goes out and he tries to trade the cow for seed. Right. He tries to recapture the masculine. He tries to find the the seed. But, you know, his mother can't recognize the value of seed because seed is not yet developed. It's like right, it's the beginning of, you know, it's the, the beginning of the fruit, let's say. Uh, but then that scene gives him a hierarchy. It gives him a hierarchy that moves all the way up to, to the sky. And he has to climb the hierarchy. He has to go up into the heavens defeat the giants in order to find the precious things. And so it, it actually is a very powerful image of what, you know, of the question of masculinity or what, what it is to be, uh, to be a man and, you know, how to deal with that, uh, especially in a world where that's not necessarily valued. Mm, yeah. I was, I was interested in the Jack and the Beanstalk choice because I never viewed it as an admirable male story. Yeah. You know, he seems like a little um, sneaky character, is able it to is. steal. And yeah, I totally of... agree with you. I've been thinking about that for a long time. And and I also was bothered by the thievery aspect of the story, how he goes up and he steals. And in some ways, what I realized is that it is not it is a negative story to some extent. It's a it's a Promethean story. It's a kind of Luciferian story of going up and stealing the fire from the gods, basically, and bringing it back. Uh, and so what I'm going to do in the male led versions is we're going to deal with the consequences of that. So the stories will bleed into each other. So in some ways, the, the fact that Jack is ambiguous and is a gray character will will then feed the rest of the stories, like the consequences of his actions will play out. Um, but it is an aspect of like the revolutionary aspect is an aspect of our of our thinking, especially as modern people. So we have to kind of deal with it and, and, and see how, how we can kind of wade through that story. And if I remember right, you know, Jack has to almost betray his, his widowed mother to, she doesn't want him to climb. Doesn't want to go. Yeah. But yeah. It's, a, it's a double thing. It's like, there's also the part of the, the mom that doesn't want to let her son go. You know, there's also that it's not a, it's not a straightforward good or bad. You know, on the one hand, what he's going to do is in some ways tricky and he's going to go and steal the fire from the gods. But, uh, you know, his mother is also something like the, you know, the the devouring mother that wants to hold on to her son and doesn't want to let him go and and do the things that he has to do. So there's also that part of the story. Yeah. And I totally got that after I revisited it and thought about this a little bit more and, um, and yeah, and it's kind of um for me, it kind of played this um this tug of war in my mind of like what's um what's moral in this world? You know, with the giant didn't I think he was seeking revenge. Didn't the father take the didn't the giant take the father's gold or something, right? That's one version of it. I think that's huh. a version that tries to make sense of why Jack is such a thief. You know, by <laughs> okay. doing it that way, they can kind of justify his moral uh. action. 
I'm not going to do that in my version. I want the ambiguity mm. to be present. The, mm. the great thing about fairy tales actually is that, and, and this is true by the way about myth and, and a biblical story is that it's not, they're never straightforward. Mm -hmm. It just aren't, you know, you can, if you, if you pay attention carefully, you can see the light and dark side of all the characters. You know, the characters are not straightforwardly good or bad. You know, that is one thing that I, um, somehow that I disagree with a little bit with uh, Tolkien. You know, he has this, he had this idea that children have to be able to see clearly who's good and who's bad. And, you know, in his story, Sauron is just basically, you know, bad. He's just the devil. He doesn't, there doesn't seem to, you don't even know like what his motivations are. There's no justification for his motivation. But in the biblical stories and in these fairy tales, you can, you can see the story from multiple uh, points of view if you, if you're, you're attentive and you're careful. And it, usually they aren't as straightforward morality tales as we might think. They're more subtle than that. Yeah. And I love that. I feel like that's a way more truthful reflection of our real lived experience in that, you know, we are complicated. Think about the Snow White story, right? Even the Snow White story, there's a little bit of Jack in there because, right, Snow White goes out into the woods and then she finds this house. And then what does she do? But she goes into the house and she steals food from the house. Then she falls asleep in someone else's house. It's like that is not a straightforward thing. Like that is not a simple morality tale. There, there's, you know, it's like it's Goldilocks level weirdness to like go into someone's house and to steal their food, and to and to and to go to sleep <laughs> in their bed. It's like so. So the the story, these stories have uh, deep ambiguities in them. Not ambiguities in the sense of that they're unclear, but in the sense that they explore human experience more subtly than we might think of at, at the, at the outset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you brought up um, how, you know, biblical stories. Now I've heard Jordan speak on this and it really helped me um, reconcile my Catholic upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that just, just some of the simple things he had brought up, like, you know, there it's mythology. You know, I never looked at it through that lens as a myth. It was always kind of taught as just truth. I felt at least as a child, it, it seemed that way. Um, and you know, some of the themes, like the main one that Jordan brought up, I remember really landed maybe as a, as a guy was, you know, pick up your damn cross and walk up the hill, mm -hmm. you know, one way to transcend this world that's full of suffering. One way to transcend that suffering is to find a mission in life, something worth doing that's meaningful and, and walk up the damn hill. Cause yeah. what else better do you have to do? Yeah, exactly. And, so... <laughs> and, but I think it's important. At least it's important to understand one of the problems about myth that we, the way that we think about myth is wrong. It's, it's, it's completely wrong. Like you, you mentioned something earlier about lie. We tell ourselves, you know, but that serve a higher truth. You know, I think that's the wrong way of understanding mythology, and it's mm -hmm. definitely the wrong way of understanding the Bible. You know, the the ancients, they're the real ancients, like not not let's say at the end of the Roman Empire, you know, in the time of, of Ovid's Metamorphosis, when it was all really way too sophisticated and, and ironic and cynical. But you know, during the time of the Homeric hymns and the time of the Iliad and the Odyssey, these were their story. Like this was not a lie that they told themselves. The, mm -hmm. the myths were the stories of their own origins and the story that they could participate in, the gods that they would go to the temple to sacrifice to, to sing to, you know. And so these were not, uh, these were not fictions, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, at least not the way that we understand fiction today. And so the categories that they deal with are obviously analogical. And that is something that I think the ancients would have understood also very well, is that when we speak about these higher, these higher patterns, we have to use analogies because we're, we're actually talking about invisible things. We're talking about things that, that say principalities that rule over, over us. And so we have to say things like God has a nose or God has hands or God has feet. But we know that these are analogies in order to understand the actions of something which is transcendent. And this is especially true of the Bible. The, the Bible is seen as stories that we live in, stories that we can participate in. And they're not the same as fairy tales. Like fairy tales 
have a kind of fictional imaginary aspect to them that is okay. You know, it's it's not like someone came up with them though. Nobody sat down and came up with, with most of these fairy tales. They really are kind of emergent uh, out of the, the just human experience. Uh, but the Bible stories, especially, you know, they're seeing the stories that you participate in. The more you get to Christ, especially. So most Christians, say Lewis talked about, you know, the myth that came true in the sense that it's de- the Bible, especially the New Testament, is definitely talking about events uh, that happen in the world and events that you can celebrate, that you can participate in, that you can that are that become part of your own life. Hmm. But they do that's have true. a mythological aspect to them. And that's why that's what that's when a lot of the modern people get it wrong is that they're not just cold retellings of events. You know, it's like this the the very selection of the events, the way that they're told, the way that they're retold are there to point to their cosmic meaning and their their participation in the same type of level of description that the ancient myth participated in. Okay. And how about my other con- preconceived notion of that, the idea that you're supposed to see yourself as every character in the story or, or you're able to, is that the wrong way to look at this? I think it's a very useful way to do it. Definitely. I think that, that I think that if you look, for example, at the way that we participate in Easter, let's say in the, in the Christian church, like if you're Catholic, the way that you, part- you participate in that feast you will be called to identify with those that killed Christ, with those that abandoned Christ. You know, you'll also be called to some extent to identify with Christ. Uh, and so you will be kind of in the way the liturgical life is, is, is done. You'll be called upon to, to associate with the different elements of the story. And so I think that's true liturgically, but I think it's also true if you really want to understand the stories. I tell people to do this all the time. You know, if you want to understand the book of Exodus, try to put yourself in the in the position of the Pharaoh too, you know, because there's a coherence to his actions. It's not just a simple thing. Uh, and when you do, that's the one of the great things about religious stories is that they kind of have that fullness, you could say, where where you can kind of see the story through the different characters and it's, and w- and can reveal an aspect of reality that, um, that you won't necessarily see if you, you see it through the other characters. Mm. Okay. And, you know, do you think that our culture has this, de- has a departure from these stories, whether, you know, I know religion has like a weight to it, unfortunately, that, um, our culture tends to push away or, or look down on. Do you think that's part of the, um, the, the reason why, you know, a lot of men feel lost and without uh, structure though, that this departure from these, uh, you know, powerful stories, these powerful narratives? I, I think so. I, I really do believe that, you know, the modern world is in some ways uh, like just, an assault on stories and an assault on identity too. And so, you know, all our heroes are deconstructed. All our heroes are pointed out to have been ultimately scoundrels. You know, if you're, if you're uh, an American, for example, then, you know, all the, all the founding fathers are now evil men, you know, and everybody in the past, you know, their foibles are pointed out in order to destroy them as examples uh, you know, this is something that's been going on for quite a while, this kind of hero deconstruction. Uh, and so that actually has a very uh, dark element to it, which is that you're you're right. Men find themselves without examples, without people that they can put their eye on in order to, to, to trace a, a path in front of them. Uh, and that's especially true of, of, I think, of religious stories. Now, it's not going away. It's still going to stay there. You can't get rid of it. Now, the, the problem is that then people like go to Comic-Con and dress up as Thor and, you know, and then, you know, dress up as Obi-Wan Kenobi or whatever. And so it's so pathetic. Like, I'm sorry. It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a sad caricature. And so the most atheistic, anti-religious, you know, uh, secularist can mock Christians and mock religion and totally unironically you know, dress up as Thor and go to Comic-Con uh, and just like liturgically participate in a story that they cannot be in, you know? And so 
there's the the depth and the, that's why I insisted on saying that for the ancients the the, the myths were their story. Mm-hmm. Ulysses was my ancestor or an ancestor like I I can trace my ancestors back to Troy, you know. That's how the ancient Greeks saw themselves. It's like one of my ancestors fought in that battle. Mm-hmm. That's my story. And so that's what the Christian story is for us. And the fact that we've forgotten so much of it that we don't know the saints that we've also we don't know much about history anymore. We're just kind of evacuating history from us. We have no examples. Uh, we find ourselves adrift in the world of, you know, Pokemon and and video games or whatever. <laughs> I do feel like we're like so ADD, shiny object <laughs> driven, <laughs> looking for likes and um, gosh, getting that quick dopamine hit. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah, do you worry about falling into um a political trap in you know kind of I don't want to say calling out but kind of um pointing out that we've kind of fallen uh off the deep end when it comes to spinning these ancient fairy tales, you know, in a really kind of weird <laughs> way that doesn't have any true like um deep meaning behind them that that is kind of lost its uh its depth um yeah. do you worry that uh folks will will kind of push back on you politically or they probably already have <laughs> I'm uh, i've been okay i've not been that it's not been that bad because i think that my ultimate solution is mostly to to do it well, right. It's to tell the good stories and to help people see the the powerful stories and the and so that has been you know I do have definitely have made videos where I criticize the contemporary storytelling, um, but I would I would hope and I hope that most of my energy goes into the positive thing, which is helping mm-hmm. people see the beauty of of stories, the beauty of participation, and the possibility of doing that today. And so because of that, I'm not too scared because I I feel like. You know, there are people out there that all they do is complain about the new Lord of the Rings or, you know, the new He-Man or whatever it is they're complaining about because they feel like the whole world is falling apart. And they're not wrong to kind of notice that. But ultimately, Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are more fruitful things to do, you know, and uh, I feel excited. I really feel excited because, you know, the people that are part of this project, you look at the illustrator that I'm working with, Heather Paulington. I mean, she is just amazing. Her mm-hmm. work is 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 award winning work, and I feel like now is a great time because a, a lot of the people that are even in the quote unquote culture industry are kind of checking out because they just there aren't interesting projects to work on anymore. People are kind of blasé or bored. They they don't find the new the recent storytelling interesting, and so you know I I found myself surrounded by amazing artists and amazing storytellers that I can associate with and we can work on together so one of the things we want to do with this with this kickstarter for example is we we're starting a publishing company where we're going to basically try to take storytelling back and try to just tell good great stories with great writers and great artists you know great comic artists great illustrators uh you know and move towards other medium if we can Beautiful. I I had a glimpse at some of the illustrations. They are in depth themselves and they are beautiful. I mean, can you tell me a little bit more about your illustrator? She seems. Yeah. So Heather, so Heather Paulington is a, she's an, she was a surface and object designer for some of the, just all the big franchises. You know, she worked with, (laughs) she worked with Marvel and Disney. Um, she worked with all the great directors. She worked on James Bond. She worked with Del Toro. She, she just, she's worked with everyone and she's just, her work is, is, is absolute mastery. I mean, she's really wonderful. Um, and she loves fairy tales and she loves the ancient stories. And so I met her and we talked and I proposed to her the possibility of like doing the, the fairy tales in a celebratory manner. And she's like, yeah, hmm. I want to do that. I love that idea. I think that's great. And so so, uh, like I said, I've been very fortunate that that someone like that would be willing to work with me. Um, and uh, there are some parts of the story that are just in the images. So there's the text of the story that you read, but then there's also a strain of storytelling and reveals from the story that are happen only in the images that you kind of have to really pay attention to the images to to be able to see. 
Uh, and we hope to do the same with the other stories as well. Yeah, just the few images I received um, had such depth. And, um, you know, you think fairy tales as, you know, maybe that's just my mind goes to childish type of imagery. And it was like, wow, this is really some dark imagery, some interesting depth into in that um, those illustrations, beautiful work. Um, yeah, she spent a lot of time studying like medieval storytelling, medieval manuscripts, the way that images are brought together the way the way that multiple events can be can be uh told in a, in <laughs> in one image uh you know she has a very she's very subtle in the way that she's doing it so you're right it, they are the images are deeper and in some ways somewhat darker than what you would ex that people might expect for kids stories but there's also one of the reasons why we see these twisted stories and the and the way that a lot of the stories have been kind of you know uh, Re, re, re uh, oriented, you could say, is also because we did go through a kind of Puritan version of these fairy tales, because the old versions, they're, they're quite dark. They're mm -hmm. not, they're not rosy at all. And so the fact that a lot of the recent tellings of these stories have been asepticized, kind of Puritan level asepticized, um, you know, open the door for, for darker twisted versions of them. And so what we want to do is find a balance. Like we want to not ignore the dark aspects of it, but then also celebrate beauty and celebrate the kind of excitement that a child can feel in this, in this kind of world where anything is possible. So a good example is for, you know, the many, few people know the version of Rapunzel where she gets pregnant in the tower, but it's like, without that part of the story, the story of Rapunzel almost makes no sense. It, it actually loses a lot of what what's going on in that story if she doesn't get pregnant in the tower. And so mm -hmm. these are the types of elements that we've added back into the story without being explicit, without being, you know, when, without trying to, to be, how can I say this? Like to, while remaining kind of sober and subtle, we mm -hmm. still are integrating the dark, some of the darker elements into it. Yeah, I I'm really excited to, to read them because I believe I got the Puritan variation of, <laughs> of these stories. So um, just hearing you talk, speak to them, I was like, huh, interesting. I never heard that. <laughs> yeah. Variation. Yeah. Well, so. the, the Snow White too is such a, it has such subtlety in it. I mean, meditating on it has brought me to realize just how subtle the, the elements are in that story. And a lot of these stories have, have that have a very deep and subtle, uh, structure it's just that because they're told so simply we can kind of be we can come under the impression that they're not sophisticated because we're used to thinking that sophistication is is brought about in in like flowery languages and 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 you know long descriptions and you know very you know it's like this kind of idea that a novel is subtle and a novel is deep you know it's like james joyce that's deep but not fairy tales right uh, but I think that's not the case. I think fairy tales actually have a lot in them. Yeah. And there's something really sweet about that of a really concise story that goes a mile deep and beyond, like infinitely deep. Um, yeah. I love that. I think that's, we, like I said, I think it's going to gain so much. It probably already has gained so much traction because I think we all long for those sort of narratives and stories. I feel like there was, um, and we miss, at least I miss that for, mm. <laughs> for a long, a long time. Um, okay. And I mean, can you imagine that, you know, you scroll Netflix, you go on Netflix and there's like a million things and you don't want to watch any of them. And you're just like basically scrolling through and you're like, how is it that they have thousands of things to watch? And I just am not, I don't, I just don't want to watch any of this stuff. Like that's how I feel. Yes. You know, I, I, when I go on these streaming services and so it's like, man, what's happening? <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. So, uh, and so, so yeah, so hopefully, you know, we, by, by really caring and bringing quality to this story, to these stories, I think we can kind of reawaken them. I hope so. I definitely think so. And yeah, you nailed it. I think we try so hard in our culture to next best new thing or, way more how more how much more extravagant can we get you know explosions and yeah just more cgi but yeah. if we could just have more cgi 
then people would want to watch these things again, you know, just add one uh, more big like CGI fight where it's actually not even two human beings. It's just like two <laughs> CGI characters duking out in front of me. And like, I could really couldn't care less. I can't watch this stuff anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's one thing I did kind of want to ask you, you know, I know in a lot of these polls about men, you know, why are we so drawn to online? Like, especially men were kind of sucked into this online pattern. Um, you know, could stories bring men back from that? Like, I feel like these stories bring us back and at least brought me back to something more heartfelt, more grounded in my roots, in my soul, it felt, rather than, um, like you were saying, CGI all over the place. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I and also like, you know, I, it was interesting. I spent some time with Martin Shaw, who's a storyteller in Dublin. And uh, I think that, you know, we're going to do it this summer with my family. We decided my kids are older. My son is 18 and my, my daughter 15 and then 12. We're going to, we're going to try to this summer have storytelling sessions where each person will be responsible for telling a story. So we'll make a fire, sit around the fire and it'll be like, it'll be serious business. Like it won't be just making it up. It's like, you better prepare, you know, your story and then tell it in a way that is captivating. And I think that that's something that's a simple way to connect with each other. You know, mm. uh, if you can, if you, if you're able to tell a good story that captivates people and, and gets them to care about, about things in life, you know, that's a great thing to do. It's a great thing to practice. And, and uh, you know, like guys together that we can, it sounds weird, but that, that's something that we can do. You know? Yeah. And I feel that's a good communication. I feel like we've, struggle to understand one another so much and like good public speaking is that too like you're always you're never not telling a story in a way i feel um and you do a great job at it <laughs> i love <laughs> listening to you unpack it will you do now how will you unload or how, you've already uh on brought your new project on fairy tales it's already out there to folks is that online or no, that's people... on yeah so, so we're doing it as a crowdfunder it's on kickstarter now snow white and the widow queen people can can go and and back it the one we're trying to reach as high an amount as possible because we are starting a publishing company and mm -hmm. you know this i'm not going to touch this money i really want to build something we want to to basically find the best artists the best writers and basically steal the culture back, like take it back. You know, it's like, instead of complaining that it's slipping away from us, it's like, let's, let's rather find the best storytellers and because everybody loves good stories. And, mm. and so it's like the, the vacuum is real. The vacuum is there because people are hungry for, for the good story. So let's just be the ones to tell them. Yeah. I, and I was going to say too, you just, like you said, let's tell, let's do something. And uh, what I love about, a yoga practice. I don't know if you do any yoga or anything. Um, but what I love about it is, you know, there's often, if you have got a good teacher, some mythology, a story with, you know, a problem and a, a solution, and then you embody it, you know, you layer it on your body. It's not just a talking school, but it's an action, you know? Um, and there's something I felt, I feel like there's something to that. Do you believe, you know, these stories, you know, are they are they like that where someone can and they're you're meant to embody them like could you pull out these admirable traits as a guy and say this is a meta admirable aim you know yeah. well i think so and i think that that's especially the religious stories that's obviously what they're for that's obviously one of the functions they have and so that you know it's not exactly the same as yoga but in terms of uh religious stories that's what lit liturgy is liturgical life is hmm. and so the liturgical year is a way to celebrate and participate in the story of christ so it's like we celebrate pentecost we celebrate ascension we celebrate uh, uh, christmas and and easter and by doing that we kind of enter into the story and we engage with it bodily right you go to church you participate in processions you bow you do all these things that are a way to kind of enter into the story and make it a point of attention uh that you physically engage with there's that there's the ritual aspect of it but then of course then there's also the example aspect which is that these characters these saints these holy people they become models for us that we should 
that we should follow them. And if you are a traditional Christian, if you're Catholic and if you're Orthodox and you not only follow them, but you also make them part of your life, you know, you have icons of them, you, you, you remember them, you ask them, you know, you ask them to help you, you ask them to pray for you. And that's a way to participate in stories and to, and to embody them in your daily life. Mm, I love it. And, you know, I was curious, you know, this story that maybe is an American story that, um, this idea of the Lone Ranger, I feel has, um, (laughs) I feel like we're paying the price for romanticizing this idea of, you know, isolate yourself as the guy, figure it out on your own. You know, there's some benefit. Is there any, is there any, um, storytelling or fairy tale um, theme that pushes back against the uh, Lone Ranger narrative that seems <laughs> to be failing? Because <laughs> I feel like, especially- Yeah, well, this- no, but it's, there's an, there's a, there are different tropes, you know? And so in, in traditional storytelling, there is the monk, right? There is the monk character. That monk character is someone who we can all appreciate, that we can all- see as an example, but usually the way to present the monk is also something that's somewhat unattainable, right? It's like, you know, the Lone Ranger is great, but if you did that, you just suck. Like you would just, (laughs) you would just die really fast, right? And so there's a way in which it's, there is a sense of, there's a possibility of having that as an ideal, but like not just, it's not the only ideal. One of the American stories that I think, um, counteracts that is the story of the coach that's a big american story the idea of like the the coach or the teacher that you know that takes a ragtag group of people and whips them into shape and helps them care about things and helps them work together even though they all at the outset hate each other that's actually a pretty good that's actually a pretty good american story that uh that can be a model for us yeah sandlot i like (laughs) there's something about like um there's a more value in, in when you're in community and in conversation, I feel. Um, no, I mean, definitely it's, it, most of us need that. Most of us can't be the Lone Ranger or the, you know, that type of, of uh, that type of like strong, uh, lonely man. You know, most people can't be that. And it's probably a good idea when you represent characters like that to show the trade-offs uh of the character not just to show the positive aspects so if you control the trade-off then you can still understand that there is an aspect of that that men will always admire like you can't avoid that you can't avoid Mm. that this image that we have of the yeah exactly the guy that's on his own that has become a master of something you know they're like the kung fu master sitting on a mountain you know who's who's basically kind of mastered it all you know that type of imagery it's a it's a perfectly legitimate image uh, but we ha- we have to be able to show the trade offs, and we also have to be able to show, like you said, the other characters, like the idea of the so y- y- the idea of the coach, or the idea of the team player, the idea of the you know uh, of being part of a band, you know, being part of a team, being part. All of that is also uh, definitely a story that's still very much available to us. Hmm. I feel. I feel. Um... Strangely inspired. That well, think of can... Robin Hood. Like Robin Hood and the Merry Man is a great example of a story of a band, a story of like, uh, you know, a band around a leader that 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 find joy in each other and that, you know, that have camaraderie and, uh, and uh, you know, like have campfires and, you know, are running away from the law, you like that kind of stuff. You know, the, <laughs> those types of images are, they, they're, they're quite, I think the Robin Hood story is quite, think of the duke of hazards like that was a that was a good american story of like two brothers and their family that you know are resisting tyranny together you know those are american stories that i think uh still have potency now yeah you know what i think well i think there's such a longing whether i think men even realize it or not to find other like-minded guys to spend regular time together mm. with <laughs> I tell you, I teach a class we called Broga in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And you tell you what, I did not think it was going to go so well. And it <clears throat> kind of didn't for a while. And then the right cool group of guys 
in the right area of the city went from 10 day daycare dads, all their kids went to the same daycare. Mm. And within like a year, you know, it exploded to, you know, 150 guys. And wow. it was like, there was clearly a need there. And, um, I don't know what it was. I just, I think they all felt it and all, you know, I've since like departed from Philadelphia. I go back and forth, but I still feel bad as if I had abandoned them. And I realize now four years well, almost four since the pandemic, how much I miss yeah. that and how hard, but that's so hard to recreate. Um, guys there don't used seem... to be, look, man, there used to be, we used to have all of that, not that long mm -hmm. ago. You know, think of the rotary clubs and like the different, mm -hmm. and people are going to hate me, but like people, the Freemasons had that, you know, I, I don't agree with everything <laughs> the Freemasons had, but let's say the <laughs> idea of, of men, helping each other like men coming together and working together towards common purposes like they used to we used to have male only clubs everywhere we'd have these men only clubs that men would you know be a little hard to join and you'd kind of have to prove yourself but then uh -huh. once you were in you were part of the group and you could you could go there and you could drink with your buddies and smoke cigars and this was a normal thing and it has been assaulted all out assault on all those organizations for the last 50 years you know, mm -hmm. through the guise of feminism, I'm sorry to say, there's been this assault uh, that we should eliminate all male-only spaces. And that's a ridiculous thing. It's like the fact that there are male-only spaces doesn't mean that we hate women or that, you know, we don't want to be with women. It just means that just as women now are having all their women-only spaces, and those are completely acceptable, uh -huh. men also need men male-only spaces, and those are very important. Uh, so it's still accessible through sports to some extent and to things like that, like golf, golf clubs. And there are a few places where that's still accessible, uh, mm. but you're right. We have to be more deliberate about it because in some ways our culture has moved away from that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really unfortunate, I've, you know, before speaking with you, I spoke with Kay Heimowitz. She wrote the book Manning Up and mm. she brought up how this is over 10 years ago, but she saw it coming, <laughs> um, that uh, you know, the rise of feminism would further send men into uh, a funk, and yeah. that yeah, and that you know, it's it's hard for um, like I said, guys, like they don't become actualized like adults when they don't have an aim and they don't have um, gosh, I, was, I don't know, there was a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like um, but yeah, I think having uh an other a community and um you know women would benefit from having more healthy men i yeah. feel <laughs> you know it's kind of the the other the thing, thing is that the thing is that we also have to know what it is like men like hierarchy they just do they like mm -hmm. hierarchy they like like men like the idea and people are going to find that weird they like the idea that there are some men that are above them in the hierarchy and that they know that though that they have a way to get there. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know that there's this, I'm in this club and there's like, you know, these founding members and they're like, they're the, they're the thing and everybody admires them. And it's like, it's like, I like that. And I can aim, I can look at them, I can aim. And then I know that I might have, I have the chance of maybe attaining that one day. It's like men actually love that stuff. And so mm -hmm. one of the problems is that, the whole social narrative has also been so anti-hierarchical. And so it's like, yeah, we can have men come together, but there can't be any competition. There can't be any hierarchy. Like we will accept it if it's just a bunch of, 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 of guys like, you know, complaining about their problems and crying together. Yeah. But if it's an actual like hierarchy of like a social order where you, you, you can ascend and you can kind of, you know, uh, aim and find a mentor and try to kind of move up, then oh, no, that stuff is horrible. You can't have that. Hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, I see it play out in my own life. You know, I find my, me and my buddies are <coughs> fishing or golfing. There's something to like this shoulder to shoulder type of therapy rather than face to face for guys or like competing, having an yeah, activity, a little, little bit, a little bit of competition, a little Couple bit jabs of, in there. Yeah. A bit of ins, a few insults, not too many. You got in, there's a balance between, you know, like affection and insults, but you got to have some of that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And it, boy, it's, it's so true. And I feel like it's so deeply rooted in who 
we are as guys and we so long for that. I wrestled my whole life. And so mm. it was like, I don't know, even like that physical rough housing, <laughs> knowing that we wouldn't kill one another. <laughs> yeah. Well, think about why guys are so attracted to jujitsu now and how jujitsu is such a major thing. It's like, I'm not into that, but I, uh -huh. I understand why, because it's like, it's, 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 how can I say this? It is the closest thing to right up, you know, let's say the dominant person is, will dominate you like and that's it. And there's nothing you can do about it. All you can do about it is get better. All you can do about it is get better. And then you're just you just struggle to get better. You can't pretend you can't you can't fake it. You know, you 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 get smashed or you or you get better. And so it's but I know so many guys that are that are into MMA or into jujitsu because it's it's still a place where you can experience that hierarchy and that competition uh, that has enough bound like it has enough boundaries around it that it's not a free for all that it has order uh, but that it's a real thing and you can and you could even in fighting other guys you can actually develop a kind of relationship with them you know yeah yeah and I think that's a good way to kind of live out these stories of masculinity to um climb to strive to better oneself through practice and work and um interesting well any is there anything else um that you want to put out there De i'm definitely gonna let have a, a look at your your uh your work with the fairy tales i'm very fascinated with how you tell these stories you know is there anything else that you want to put out there where could I mean, folks if find people you? want to see yeah if people want to see the most of the things i'm doing you can go to the symbolicworld.com and that's where that's where most of the stuff is we you know that's where we talk about symbolism interpret these stories that kind of have a a vision of of reality and there's a there's actually now a online community there people that are thinking about symbolism interested in these questions um, and so obviously we, we always try to direct people towards real life communities, which is why I tell people to go to church all the time. Uh, but there, the online world is helpful. It, it's helpful to kind of give yourself at least a running start to, to understand what's happening around you and then move back into the world. Beautiful. Um, this is super helpful and, uh, it's, I did not expect to feel uplifted. I expect <laughs> so. I feel, I feel better, um, about maybe, maybe our way out of this dark time for guys is, is telling better stories. Yeah. It's part of it for sure. Definitely. Wonderful. Well, this is really fun. I, I really am grateful that you're willing to do this. Um, and with, on such no, short notice, <laughs> um, I'm going to put this out there, Jonathan. And, uh, I don't know if you ever do like a collaborative social media post or anything, but Anything yeah, well, I, I mean, do. tell me, yeah, send me the link and I'll definitely share it. Like, I'll definitely share this. That'd be great. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I'd love to chat again. Um, if you ever want to unpack anything, if there's any t uh, topics or any stories that I love listening to the story specifically, that's because uh, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, wow, I never thought of it that way. I never yeah. saw it through that lens. And so it's really helpful um, to hear you narrate it, actually. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, Jake. It's good to meet you. Yeah, you too. And uh, I'm going to try to to get a hold of your buddy, J Jordan. I'm sure he's like very difficult. Yeah, it's a little harder. <laughs> it's a little harder to get on the I'm end of the sure. line than I am. That's for sure. But if you have any um, suggestions of other folks willing to speak on this, like maybe your brother, even I was looking into, um, I don't know, if, is it Matthew? Is that how yeah, you say Matthew, it? Matthew, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. yeah. Appreciate the work you're doing. It's uh, it's great. I love it, and uh, I'm definitely gonna gonna look more into it. So I appreciate it. Cool. That was nice to meet you, Jake. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Bye.